Okay, hi everyone. We're going to start, so if everyone can just take a seat. Um, I'm Raya Jalabi, I'm Reuters correspondent based in Iraq. Today we are gathered here for a panel on what we're calling uh, post, uh, prospects for stabilization in post-ISIS Iraq. So as a reminder, today's session will be conducted in two parts. The first session, will, the first part of the session will be on the record. It will be live streamed and conducted in the presence of the media. Uh, I'm supposed to also vociferously encourage you to tweet actively using the Chatham House official hashtags. The first one is uh, hashtag CH events and the second is hashtag Iraq initiative. The second portion of the session will be off the record. So as a reminder, at the time when we start the Q&A session, I'll remind everyone to go off the record. So today we have, um, I'd like to kick off with a 30 to 40 minute conversation between myself and our distinguished panelists um, who I'd like to introduce first. So to my left, we have Ahmed Muhammad. So until recently, it was known as Mursal I. Um, he was a once anonymous blogger who was giving us and the world vivid dispatches from Warsaw under siege. Next, we have um, Rafael de Iodice, who's the head of unit at the European Commission's directorate, at the Directorate General of International Cooperation and Development. Did I get that right? right. Great. Mm -hmm. And Zain Ali Ahmed, who's the UNDP's resident representative in Iraq. So I'd like to start um, with the notion that this conference has focused a lot on Iraq in transition. So it's an evergreen theme. I think a lot of people in this room would agree. But in particular, when we talk about the liberated areas, the notion of transition is essential. Um, it's been less than two years since Iraq declared victory over Islamic State. And for a lot of people in this room, and certainly to certain people on the previous panel, we had discussed the fact that Mosul and the state of certain liberated areas is, was what we called, what some people called the great story. But I think the facts on the ground belie that. Uh, a lot of, as Ahmad will be able to speak to, a lot of um, the liberated areas are still under rubble. More than 1.6 million people are still living in displacement camps and you have no daily security incidents. So you ask a lot of people in this room and they might be able to tell you that the prospects are optimistic. However, if you ask people living in Anbar or Nainawa, they might have a bleaker description of the situation. So with that in mind, I'd like to turn to the panel to sort of represent, who represent a variety of views on the issue. Um, and with all due respect to previous descriptions of Mosul and the liberated areas, I think the conversation we can gear it towards the state of the liberated areas at present. So if we could start with the notion of stabilization. So it's a word that gets thrown a lot around a lot in the international community, but actually means a lot of different things to many people. So if you could maybe start by addressing what stabilization actually means. Zaina, if you'd like to kick us off. Thank you very much, Raya. Actually, before we started this panel, Omar was telling me what is stabilization. And, and I'll give a little bit of a technical definition of what stabilization means to the United Nations and to the United Nations Development Program. There was always the notion of there's humanitarian and there's development and there's nothing in between. And, and then I think the international community as well as most UN agencies have, have looked at this as a continuum. There is humanitarian, we wind down humanitarian operations when there's no more acute need for humanitarian operations and we assumed as development practitioners then then we would go into development straight in. But lessons learned have shown that this is not the way. There is a vacuum between the winding down on humanitarian operations and the building up on the short, medium, and long-term development needs. And this is the continuum that we're looking at now is stabilization. So where are we in that continuum at the moment in Iraq? In Iraq, UNDP, under the mandate, actually the mandate for stabilization was given to us by the coalition looking into a what we all call a new way of working or sustaining peace that this vacuum and the five liberated governorates especially in 31 most hard hit localities within the five governorates have to stabilize enough until development picks up and by stabilization we mean minimum minimum standards to bring people back to their communities and yes 1.6 million people are still displaced and that's very unfortunate but 4.3 or 4.4 million people have come back. I'm from the region. We tend to be very pessimistic. I'm very worried about Iraq, especially because of what's been happening over the last week. But there is also some good news. 
If we look at other countries in the world and in the region, you see that we could not bring back people to their places of origin before it becomes a protracted displacement that is very, very hard mm. to bring back. So the UNDP programming is sort of a pool funding. It's a military civilian. It's the civilian implementation arm funded by more than 20 donors in sort of a pool fund working on the basic necessities of bringing back. So it's electricity, it's, wo it's housing, it's water networks, it's schools, it is uh, health centers, it's education. And then looking back at Mosul, what we were in the, in the previous mm. panel, yes, Mosul still has a lot of rubble and still has a lot of destruction, but a lot has been done in Mosul. And we see that the returning, the, the returns are picking up. Mm. Rafaela, would you have anything to add to? Yeah, that? well, I just can complement to mm. what my colleague said. Of course, we have uh, the same vision as the European Union, very much in line, and of course, are part <coughs> of uh, one of the major uh, financing institutions of UNDP. But I would just add to what you say, which is bringing back electricity, bringing back the people, and many went back with the help of, uh, of the international community, but also of the government. But still, uh, what is really needed uh, to create the real stabilization is real rebuild the human capital. And rebuilding the human capital brings me back to one of the panels we had before. It's about cultural heritage, ownership, recognizing yourself in your local communities, in the local governments, and that's, I think, uh, the link between the humanitarian, the long term, and that's what is still, I would say, if not missing, but uh, still under construction. But we, I think in the next, uh, we will continue more in detail on that. Well, certainly, I mean, the, the sort of Islamic State's rule over Mosul and much of the, the now liberated areas of Iraq, uh, the, the draconian rule suppressed a lot of this pre-existing social fabric. So, Omar, this is something you talk about a lot and you write about a lot. This, this In Mosul in particular, it's a city that has such a rich cultural uh, and complex social fabric. So how do you, with that in mind, how do we, how does the international community go about helping Muslims regenerate that? I think we should start by reviewing the, all the international efforts in Mosul and how did they take place in the city after the liberation of Mosul. Uh, we have to admit that there were lots of funds, EU, other countries, but we haven't seen any plan dealing with a strategy or in strategic way dealing with the reconstruction of Mosul. For example, uh, the reconstruction, which is still local, has begun in the old city of Mosul just recently. While, and I've, I've always been critical of UNDP and other organizations, uh, uh, UN and its agencies, not for nothing, but when the city was liberated, it was seen as this huge province of Nineveh was only seen as two sides of the river, east and west. And all the reconstruction began in the east side of the city, which wasn't heavily damaged. But it was easy for many agencies to get direct outcomes, to say that we are working there, while they ignored uh, 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 the west part of the city, which has severely damaged uh, uh, during the has been severely damaged during the battle. Uh, as a consequence of this, many people weren't able to return, and. This has also led to the departure of, when we speak about cultural heritage and the identity, it led to the departure of all the people who were living in the west side, those who were working in business, those who were running the old markets of the city, those who were part of the dynamics of the city, they had to leave to the other side and they have established a new life which is disconnected from their past. Because when we speak about uh, the identity, we always speak about uh, the old part of the city of Mosul has been the heart of this uh, 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 process of the, the creation of the identity of Mosul. Another side of this reconstruction was, we have noticed that international funds have, been, have never been dealing with Nineveh as a one government. Uh, apparently for many uh, international donors, when they say Nineveh, they only refer to Christian areas or 
when they say Sinjar, they only refer to Yazidis. When it comes to Mosul, they refer to Sunnis. So they dealt with us as divided communities, and this led to many other consequences. Uh, the money is there, but there is no plan, neither from the Iraqi government or from the international organizations. Uh, we have still no hospitals, uh, no infrastructure, uh, no bridges. Only one bridge has been uh, uh, reconstructed, the older bridge of uh, Mosul. The other bridge was, I don't know, in, in, in a certain way they have just reconnected the bridge, uh, while other bridges are impossible to be reconstructed. Any person from west side of the city of Mosul needs at least five hours to reach a small health center in the east side. And we are speaking about two million of people, and half of them have, uh, are still living in the camps. And even those who have decided to return back to Mosul are leaving the city again. And that's quite a bleak picture that you're giving, that you're describing of Mosul. For many people in the audience, they don't get a chance to go to Mosul and experience what life is like there. Um, but in term, I think what's a central point that you mentioned is this idea of a plan. Um, we unfortunately don't have anyone from the Iraqi government on the panel to be able to discuss their, their idea of a plan, but the people on the ground often describe this uh, fundamental disconnect between the government and the people of Mosul, because, and, and this exists in other parts of um, in Anbar, for example, but people fundamentally describe this disconnect. There's no one, there. you don't see, uh, and often when I'm interviewing people in these cities and these areas, they mention that you, you just don't see any government interaction, you don't see enough reconstruction, you don't see enough funds being poured into these areas. So the international community, uh, there's a, a sort of a perception that Iraq must solely rely on the international community to rebuild these areas. And so with that in mind, uh, can you speak more about this idea of a plan? And, and that comes from, you know, from, from physical reconstruction to what, what, what are you doing to help reconstruct the social fabric? I do not want to become the advocate for the government. That, <laughs> that's not my role on this panel. But I have to say that there is a plan. There is a disconnect, Raya, I mm. agree. But there is a plan, and the plan was in the Kuwaiti conference. The problem, of course, is that the World Bank has estimated that it needs 88, more than $88 billion for reconstruction. When I speak about UNDP, backed up by 20 plus international donors, we have 1.2 billion. So it is not even, I don't know what per, meager percentage. That doesn't also mean that the government is not working through different channels on reconstruction. It has the refato, it, has, it works through line ministries, etc. Is this enough? Of course it's not enough because the, the demands are huge. What I would like to bring forward is to acknowledge what is being done and then support the institutions into doing more rather than saying nothing is being done. Mm -hmm. And then again, I talked about the physical reconstruction. Is this enough to bring black people to their places? No, it's not. And intention surveys that we we do an IDP camps as the UN. There are three things that are prerequisites for people to return. One is security, and that is very important in places like Sinjar, for example, for people to come back. Two is housing, interestingly, and I think that is testimony that the basic, basic infrastructure, like some water and some electricity and a health center, not the health centers or the schools, are there so housing is very important and this is why we are now focusing in our next uh, phase on housing. And number three, it is actual jobs and I think that is the hardest to bring about. The way we're dealing with it is that we try to inject quick cash into the economy. Is this enough, $20 per day for people to rebuild their own houses through cash for work and the local economy to, to be revamped? Of course not. But do we look at it as a stopgap until the economic situation is better? Definitely. I think the crunch is the issues related to livelihoods creation. And for livelihoods creation, we need a vital private sector. And again, there is a private sector development strategy. Is it being implemented? Do they, is there a capacity to implement it as quickly as is needed? I'm not sure. Yeah. I will, uh, yeah, I would like again to add something because again, I, I have some, maybe more of my personal experience in conflict areas that I've been dealing with for 27 years. If I'm 54, if I were an Iraqi who's 54, I would have seen 
first Saddam Hussein, then the fall, then the war, then again a re reconstruction, and again a panel like this one. And I will look at me, and I understand when I go to Mosul, I've been three times in Mosul since the liberation, uh, so-called liberation, uh, and I go there and say, okay, we are there, we are donor community, we are listening to you, we brought you back electricity. They stare at me, and sometimes you just think, wow, what can I say more? They will look at me and say, okay, thank you, goodbye, go home. And that's I understand. So somehow on one side, I understand the frustration. On the other side, again, going to Mosul, you see the difference still. Because when it was a mountain of rubber, you see people starting to come back. But that's certainly not enough. And to what you said, it's electricity, it's jobs, it's work, it's money, it's whatever, it's justice. It's justice, public finance management. Why did the ISIS become strong? ISIS were, well, they were terrorists. They were killing people, raping women. They've been doing awful things. But at the same time, sometimes they were also governing. Mm -hmm. they, gave a, they were giving to some people a kind of structure. And that's what also people want. A, a kind of state which is really present. And that's where we as international community, in partnership with the government, in partnership with local communities, in partnership with local heroes, like the one I have here on my right, we have to at least put our goodwill and work against the lots for something which is a legal system which works, a transparent. This morning we were talking about how to stop corruption. And uh, it, it's easy for us also to say, you know, everything's so corrupted and we didn't do enough that, okay, let's just put some money and that's it. So kind of these discussions are, we shouldn't give up, but we should enforce as donor community or partners that part. And uh, still, uh, again, it's, it's a way up for the moment. Mm. I think, I think this notion of uh, the weakness of the state is one that we've come back to again and again in all the different discussions uh, throughout the day. And it is a very important point when it comes to the cooperation with, and, and sort of working in partnership with the international community. In, in that particular regard, um, what are the sort of main obstacles to working with, or I mean, I'm phrasing the, the question slightly negatively, but what, you know, when it comes to working with the local and central governments in a place like Morsud, what are the main impediments to getting your projects off the ground and doing your programming? Um, I, I think I can talk about this because we have a very bad experience in the relationship between the international community and the local government. Let's talk about the example of the former governor of Mosul. When the people were calling on the international community, especially the international funders who were uh, 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 present in Mosul uh, through their funds, the people were telling them, you are funding the corruption. Stop dealing with this governor. The response we get, we have to deal with the officials. And then they started, uh, uh, like, it's one of the uh, uh, b bad results of this is they enjoyized the community. The enjoyization of the local activities have led to, the, uh, uh, to, to feed the corruption again. There were many local activities, uh, young people working in the city trying through their local initiatives. They were enjoyized because the problem is that you cannot work, you cannot receive funds unless you are an NGO. And this NGO becomes connected to the local government. And we know that the local government is corrupted. So with all of this, uh, it seems that the international community either didn't want to uh, uh, support the, the reconstruction from a distance, or they just wanted to deal with an official whom they know that he is corrupted and that his system is corrupted. Uh, the problem of the reconstruction is in, 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 in Mosul and in Nineveh in general, is it lies in the first question we asked before we start this. We want to know the international community's definition of three things, reconstruction, stabilization, and what they call it, reconciliation. We need to understand how do they define these three things, because I believe that we, as local people from the city of Mosul, we have completely different definitions of this. For example, when a certain uh, uh, international NGO comes to the 
local community and tell them, you have to sit together, you have to speak to each other, you have to talk. They told them, but we don't have a problem. Why should we, we don't have a problem. Why, why do you assume that we, as or Muslims or uh, Christian, uh, uh, Yazidis or Muslims, whatever, why do you assume that we have a problem and that we should talk? They say, no, we think that you have this kind of like conflict between your religions. They say, no, we don't have this problem. Then this kind of efforts has created, I will not name this uh, uh, NGO, which is a big one, and I have reported this to them. They have created another conflict in the city. Now we have the conflict of the rural and urban conflict. The people, now I have been asked today here in Chatham House, are you from uh, a rural area or from an urban area? I said like, what's this question? I mean, did we stop asking are you Sunni or Shia and now we ask are you from the village or from the uh, city? So there are many things need, need to be reviewed. And I would also say that we had a tragedy in Mosul that led to the death of 200 people because of the corruption. And I looked into all of this uh, when the ferry uh, 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 was drawn in the uh, uh, Tigris River. I found out at the end that this so-called uh, ferry was uh, a floating bridge actually provided by the military, US military, to the army. And then through the corruption, this bridge was sold to someone who was connected to the local government. So it's all linked. We need to review uh, the, these strategies and also for, for the Iraqi government. The Iraqi government, when you talk about the disconnect from between the people and the uh, government, it's on the contrary. The people are asking the government, and their people are seeking the government. The people are asking the Iraqi government, just look at us, deal with us as Iraqis. We are ready to deal with you. We need a representation in the Iraqi government. Uh, uh, the young generation in Mosul now is disconnected from the old problems. Mm. I'd like to give uh, Zen and Rafael the opportunity to respond to that because there was a lot of uh, Thank you. statements made. But Thank I'd just you. like to clarify one thing, which is that I think it is not an entirely accurate representation to say that there is no conflict amongst the people of the city. I mean, I, it, it's a fundamental fact that you often still hear a lot of disconnects. They may not be drawn along the traditional sectarian lines, but there is still a lot of tension. So the efforts at reconciliation. But, but, but let, let, me, let me say this this way. What do you think a farmer in Nineveh plains, what do you think a, a, a kind of problem he has if he is a Christian? What do you think pro, a kind of problem he have with someone in Sinjar? He's, yes, he probably even doesn't care about all of this. Uh, the way that these problems, problems are being politicalized. It's just like when the experts say that there is sectarianism, we have to say there is sectarianism. When they decided that is, there is no more sectarianism, it's gone all, all of a sudden. So we have actually to look into more local context of these problems. So with that in mind, would you like to address some of those points? I, yeah, either? two points. Mm. One is the United Nations is an institution, and we work with institutions, whether we like it or not. And there are types of institutions that we work with. We work with the government at the national level, at the subnational level, at the governorate level, at the grassroots level, but it is the government structure one. We work with civil society, usually. Unfortunately, in Iraq, it's a very nascent civil society. We also partner with private sector, and unfortunately, there's very little private sector in Iraq. <coughs> What I'm trying to say is the, is the United Nations and the international community cannot deal with individuals. Whether we like it or not, and whether we like the person or we do not like the person, these are elected officials. We go on the prioritization again, $1.2 billion for stabilization and five governorates with this massive destruction is nothing. We go on a prioritization. One of the safeguards that we do, we say this prioritization meeting that goes over three days, we do not only want the governor and the councils, the governor councils and the mayors to be there to prioritize with us. Please bring in the local communities and we try to bring in the local communities. Are we able to do that in Mosul for all Muslawis? I'm sure we cannot. What I'm, and again, I'm not defensive. I'm saying this is the process by which we and the international community works in terms of the prioritization. In terms of the corruption, UNDP, for the first time, we work in 158 countries, 
we set up a dedicated unit in the Office of Audit and Investigation so that any, any claim that comes from a small person who is uh, a youngster in Ninawa or someone I don't know where gets a claim, this claim goes to the Office of Audit and Investigation. As of now, we have 85 audit and investigation cases that are still being investigated. So we try to set up the checks and balances so that we make sure that the money we spend goes to where it needs to be spent cutting off on the corruption cases. That is why in some countries we implement through institutions. In Iraq, we implement, we as, I mean, and that is not usual for UNDP worldwide. So that's on the institutions. If that is not as, participatory as it can be, we can widen the participation, but there is also a ceiling to which, to how much participation we can, we can bring into the prioritization. So that's one. On the social cohesion, with all due respect, Amar, I'm sorry, I'm from the region and I'm, I'm Lebanese, so I was born during the civil war in Lebanon. I know what wars look like, unfortunately. And I think Iraq, again, unfortunately has a lot to do in terms of social cohesion. We, we call it reconciliation. The government of Iraq doesn't like to call it reconciliation, but there are so many fault lines. And it's not only according to sectarian uh, or religious. Actually, the Iraqi government but also are, call it reconciliation. I don't like to call it reconciliation. Fine. The social, and, and for us and the international community, working on the social cohesion agenda is of utmost importance and one of our main donors on social cohesion is here and they know that we're doing all the background studies and implementation that is needed. There has to be an overall agenda on social cohesion and the government would like to move that, but I think it is too naive to think that we do not need social cohesion in Iraq. To pick up on that point, uh, one of my last questions that I'd have before we turn it over to the audience is about this notion of reconciliation, social cohesion, or whatever we want to call it. Um, one of the central issues in post-ISIS Iraq has been the question of the ISIS-affiliated families. It's a very fraught question in the country. There are thousands of people who are either lingering in camps in Iraq or in Syria in pretrial detention who are living in informal settlements across the country with no access to documentation. We have 40,000 children that aren't in school because they can't access education. It, it's a fun, it's a, when we talk about social cohesion, I think especially in the liberated areas, this is the fundamental question. So. With that in mind, there are also many security actors who have an influential role to play in this uh, in this maelstrom. Um, and as as you know, UNDP implements programming in Iraq in these areas with these families. Has there ever been instances where security actors do intervene or if affect your programming in any way? And how do you deal with that? Let me get the question right. Is it how we're dealing with the ISIS? Well, left behind that's families? Part, I mean, or? let's do it in two parts, sure. So the ISIS-affiliated families, what, what, when we're talking about social cohesion, what can we do to advance the issue? Okay. Uh, unfortunately, the ISIS-affiliated families are still in, mostly in camps. Mm -hmm. They're not in the communities. And there's a lot of resistance from communities even to get many of those affiliated back. It is, in the, I think, on the minds of every UN agency and every international development partner to look at that issue. Whether there is, it is not UNDP alone, because if you look at it, it looks at the mandates of UNAMI as the political arm of UN women with issues of gender, with UNICEF, with the kids, etc. Mm -hmm. So the special representative of the Secretary General is working on a combined UN support and I know that she is also talking to the international donors and the international <coughs> part, development partners to look at that issue. Specifically, I think the, the notion of collective punishment comes up a lot when we talk about reconciliation regarding the ISIS-affiliated families. So is that something that comes up in any of your programming or when you're trying to institute or implement any kind of uh, programs with these families and providing assistance? Not really, because we are not yet in the place where your NDP is supporting directly mm. these families. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd like to turn it over to the audience. So we have about 35 minutes left. Uh, just as a reminder, this portion of the session will be off the record. So please refrain from uh, tweeting at this point.